Well, good morning. And uh, first thing I'd like to do is thank TIA for the opportunity to come and talk to you for a few minutes about what we see um, as far as driving uh, 5G. We've heard about 5G a few times this week so far. Uh, and I also realize I'm dangerously close to being the last guy between you and lunch, so I'm going to try and keep this moving along pretty crisply here. Uh, let's see, so let's jump right in. Well, the obligatory safe harbor statement, I, I like the way the gentleman from Verizon phrased it. It's a speed reading contest, and that's enough of it. So one of the questions we did a lot of times about 5G, isn't it too soon? We're, we're, you know, not everybody's done rolling out 4G. Why are we talking about 5G now? Well, frankly, it's time. If you look at the timeline that we've had in our uh, industry so far, you go back to the 80s, even the early 90s, I'm sure a lot of us in this room remember a time when half of our conversations started, hey, guess where I'm calling you from? And that was fine for that day and age. Not so much anymore. <clears throat> the 2000s, 3G, we moved into rudimentary data services. It was much better than circuit switch at the time. I had a, a, a big hand in uh, deploying our 2G circuit switch data, and uh, you know I, I know we all miss those WAP browsers from back in those days. Flash forward 2010, 4G gets here, and finally we're getting to what we can consider a true mobile internet experience. So when we look forward to 2020, what are going to be the trends? What are going to be the things that, that really drive network utilization, network architectures? What are going to be the requests or the, the demands from the customer? What does a 5G network need to be able to um, produce? So um, shamelessly filching here from the uh, Cisco uh, VNI forecast, 7x increase by 2019. I think those numbers are pretty well established and, and mostly accepted by everybody. Um, but the, again, 7x over the next four or five years is a huge increase when one's looking at the capacity of the network. Uh, then we go to the observed trends. So let's stop here for a minute and spend a little bit of time. Interactions becoming more electronic, and I think we all see that. Um, obviously, Apple with Apple Pay is started to bring home the financial aspect of this, and frankly, we all do more with our phones. I, I've been in this business for quite a while, mostly on the handset side, and uh, it's, it's become one of my uh, go-to conversation starters, as I'll notice somebody using a, a device Device, perhaps a new device. How do you like that phone? And uh, it's always interesting to get that feedback as to what they're doing with the phone, what they expect from the phone, what they expect from the network. More and more, you see people looking at the device, interacting with the device, not necessarily talking on the device. Uh, obviously, we've probably all seen that. It's a lesson learned. Okay, so internet everywhere. Um, you know, as was just discussed, we, we're getting to a, a place where it is a reasonable expectation that internet everywhere, in the car, in the hotel, on the road, in the plane at 30,000 feet, it's becoming more and more a part of our, our culture, a fabric of our culture. And lastly, the devices are, are becoming smarter. And uh, I'm going to have to thank my uh, colleague, Scott, for putting in the uh, seven of nine uh, since we had a, the uh, cyborg anthropologist here. I'm, I'm hoping he's still in the room for that one, a, a little bit of a, uh, a tip of the hat. But definitely, if you look at the processing power we have, not just in the handsets, but also in the network today, it, there's vast potential for what we can do with a 5G network. So let's. Go forward a little, okay. We. So I'm not sure if this is a little bit of an eye chart from the back, but when we look at 5G, we're starting from a business and use case first. When, when we first started contemplating the topic of 5G, one of the very first realizations that me and others within Sprint came to was this can't be just about building a bigger pipe. If, if it's just about building a bigger pipe, yeah, we kind of know where that conversation goes. What really is of interest, though, are what are the innovative services, products that we can offer to the customers in the future? So uh, uh, my colleague Scott Magaldi does a lot of work in 5G as well. Um, the information evolution, or as he's also termed it, uh, innovative, or, yeah, innovative information interactions. On-demand, understanding predictive network service. 
And uh, my friend Tom Sizemore from Alcatel Lucent has given an example a number of times uh, how the network obviously has the intelligence to know, um, in his example, is when a user is driving down a street in New York City toward a tunnel. The network has the intelligence to know that user is getting ready to go into a tunnel. They're streaming a YouTube or a Netflix video right now. Let's allocate more resources, give them an extra 500 megabits before they get into the tunnel so that the service continues on streaming without disruption. That kind of intelligence is definitely something that we can tap with SDN and NFV. Uh, communication evolution, well, obviously the, the one that gets talked about a lot is uh, automatic uh, voice translation or, or language translation services, which actually obviously has, I travel a lot internationally, that is something I wish was here today. There's a lot of other things though that we see, and I like the term non-SIM based communication. And uh, I'll stop there for a moment. One of our visions of 5G is that it is, if you will, um, it is orchestrated interconnectivity between networks and between services. So it's not enough just to be able to interoperate on a 3GPP and 3GPP2 network. This also now starts to include 802.11 networks. It starts to include Bluetooth networks, um, Zigbee. NFC, et cetera. So non-SIM um, interactions with information are just as important, well, maybe perhaps not just, but as important, <laughs> close, as the macro network. Let's see, one other thing I'll say there. We do expect that LTE and 5G will be living side by side for a great many years to come. I'll sit, probably talk about that more later. Device interaction, augmented reality, experience. Um, augmented reality, we've all seen the videos. I, I know some of my colleagues have spoke here in the past and uh, presented a video that Sprint did um, talking about its 5G vision uh, um, called our Audubon uh, vision. One thing I added recently, and I was really pleasantly surprised when I, I heard the news that uh, Microsoft had announced its intention to build Arduino support directly into Windows 10. And uh, so for those that aren't the, the do-it-yourself at home geek enthusiast, um, Arduino being a major, the uh, IO interface for Raspberry Pi and uh, home projects, I think we may be, we're moving into an era where the do-it-yourselfer home hobbyist can all of a sudden start to have internet of things right in their home. So it's not a question of do I have to go to the, to the store and buy a, Internet of Things connected, exhaust fan for the attic. I can do it myself uh, by parts I piece together from Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, okay, entertainment evolution. And this is uh, one that drives a lot of our, our use cases when we look at the challenges of this because we don't really just see it as um, downloading videos, watching a movie, et cetera, but also becoming a more interactive um, if you will, gaming. Uh, one of the things that we show in the, uh, the video is uh, two kids who are playing baseball together. And virtually, they're both wearing VR goggles. One in, is, happens to be in the United States, the other is in Japan. And there's uh, that, if you look at that as a use case, it puts some very strong demands on the network, particularly around latency. And uh, that is something that in the 5G conversations that I've been involved in, uh, latency time and time again has become the, one of the driving factors. It's not all about the bandwidth, but being able to get the data through the network predictively on time and consistently. Uh, physical safety evolution, uh, that one's fairly uh, self-apparent with uh, HD cameras, GoPros, et cetera. You can start to see a lot more of this in vehicle. Um, as uh, we were discussing earlier. Also trust though. We have to, and I, I like the way they said it, uh, validating that the machine that you're talking to is the machine you think it is. There has to be an intrinsic layer of trust between the device, the network, the end user, the end service. So, capabilities, data throughput, lower latency, um, you know, we're, you, I don't know that the, uh, a proper line has been drawn in the sand yet about what throughput we expect from 5G. Uh, I, I kind of, in, myself, endear toward a, a concept of, okay, you can do a gigabit in the cell, but what about at the cell edge? And that's become kind of some, I've heard some people put that out as a marker, being able to do a gigabit out to the cell edge. 
Throughput, don't get me wrong, it is important, but it can't be the whole story. Lower latency. One of the interesting things I saw on this recently was a demonstration where they put uh, VR goggles on a subject and uh, with cameras facing forward, they simply tossed a ball to him. And with a one millisecond latency, the uh, subject was able to catch it pretty much every time. Two millisecond latency, 50-50, uh, three milliseconds, he couldn't catch it at all. It, he missed it every time. So if we're looking at these interactive services, and uh, you know, I think entertainment, or even if we think back to when the Nintendo Wii came out, and all of the applications that were built around exercise, fitness, health, et cetera, this becomes a, a very critical part of it. Mobility, um, again, I'm gonna go back to this one because I, I think this is one of the challenges that we have uh, going forward is tearing down the walls that have traditionally existed between 3GPP, IEEE, they haven't always played well together, and that's something that has to change. The, the 5G concept, 5G networks, have to be interoperable across technology bounds. Traffic steering, um, we've already heard a good bit about this, or, or the, the concept of it with uh, NFV, and uh, I'm, I was already getting to multi-radio access integration. It just has to work across all air interfaces so seamlessly and simultaneously. So we'll touch on timing. Uh, global proof of concepts in, uh, by 2018 in Asia. Uh, my friends from Samsung have uh, already said that they plan on demonstrating something that they would consider pre-standards by 2018. They're hoping that the standards would be there by 2020. And uh, with commercial launches early to mid 2020, I think that's fairly aggressive. Uh, I, they can certainly do their trials by uh, 2018. That shouldn't be a problem. Um, and as I was saying to some other folks that earlier this week, the, you know, the good news is we're not looking at commercial launches until 2020. The bad news is that's less than five years away, and there's a lot of work that needs to happen, particularly in standards. Also, policy work as well as spectrum work, ITU, has a, p a part to play in this. We do expect that uh, uh, we'll be seeing new air interfaces, particularly above six gigahertz. There's a lot of talk about 18 gigahertz, 28 gigahertz, uh, all the way up to 66 and, and higher. Um, so there's a lot of policy work that will have to happen there in the spectrum and regulatory side. Um, requirements started to talk about trust, but um, trust and security, uh, I don't know that I can overstate that. It, it has to be inherent all the way through from the device being secure, the communications being secure, the path to the services, the application, et cetera, all having to have inherent built-in trust and security. Uh, usability, again, as we, a lot of us in here know, the user doesn't care. They don't care if it's on the LTE network, a 5G network, a Wi-Fi network, a Bluetooth network. They simply want it to work. So that is part of our, our goal in uh, standards work is to make sure that the APIs, the hooks are in there between all of the networks so that it simply works for the consumer. New spectrum, energy efficiency, one of the um, interesting points that comes up a lot with 5G is talking about densification of the network. And of course you hear that with the small cell conversation as well. Uh, I think uh, NGMN perhaps when in, in their white paper mentioned a 60x increase in cell site density. And as somebody astutely pointed out, today's energy consumption by the um, base stations, even the small cells, simply is not scalable if we're looking at a 60x increase. So that's another big challenge for the vendor community, the technology community, is figuring out how we can do this and still maintain a sustainable energy footprint. New back backhaul solutions, um, well then this is for both macro and, and small cells. As I say, a lot of assumptions are made around, if you will, an ideal backhaul, um, all the way down to one millisecond end to end, which is extremely aggressive. And a lot of the technologists I've talked to have commented that that one millisecond end to end latency is probably more challenging than all of the other aspects, than doing a gigabit at the edge of the cell is probably easier than maintaining one millisecond. And then 
you know, this is one, one area where when I talk with uh, colleagues from Europe, um, colleagues from America, this is one area where we have a similar situation. We don't have as dense a fiber deployment uh, in the United States or in Europe as exists in the Asia Pacific region. region. So this is one of the areas for, um, a, uh, if you will, uh, evaluation is 5G networks under non-ideal backhaul scenarios. How do we use microwave and still deliver the experience that the customer would expect? So again, I wanted to step through fairly quickly. I know we're kind of up on time here today, but give you a, a few thoughts or a little bit of insight into what we're thinking. There's a lot more behind it. Uh, obviously, some of it gets into roadmap that I can't necessarily share today, but uh, I think Let's see, yeah, that, that kind of wraps us up. So um, thank you very much. Again, thank you, TIA, for the time. I appreciate it. And I uh, hope everybody has a good rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>